709 Reasons Why is brought to you by Calman. Hi, welcome back to uh, the latest episode of 709 Reasons Why, um, Portrait's tech show. Uh, this week we want to talk a little bit about high dynamic range and demystify HDR. And uh, in particular, we also want to talk a little bit more about Dolby Vision as one of those methodologies to get HDR to the homes. So what would be better to have a real specialist from Dolby being with us as a special guest this week? Um, so welcome Nate McFarlane from Dolby. Hi, nice to be here, Marcel. Thank you guys so much for having me. Super pumped to be here. My name is Nate McFarlane. I'm a senior content engineer on Dolby's commercial partnerships team. And I'm here today to hopefully help demystify what is Dolby Vision, what's HDR, and kind of make this a little more understandable for everybody at home. So maybe that's the right time to start to learn a little bit about uh, your job sure. at Dolby, is a, yeah, the, uh, sure. a commercial partnership team. Sure. So uh, where are you involved? What is your team doing? And I know there are other teams like in Sunnyvale. Yes. So uh, where are the? what are they doing? What, what are you doing? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, great question. So the commercial partnerships team at Dolby is really in charge of uh, all of our training efforts around Vision and Atmos, and then also kind of the support aspect of things and doing things like training, certification, education, but then also helping folks in the field, right? Because once you're in the weeds, you're going to have questions, and that's where my team comes in to help. My role specifically, I do display evaluations for under kind of this lens of, hey, would this display be suitable for Dolby Vision content creation? Now, that's different than Dolby Vision content playback, and that's where th devices like TVs, phones, tablets come in. I'm more focused on kind of those uh, creation displays. So think of reference displays or more kind of prosumer type displays that people are actually doing grading and mastering on. So it's a really cool gig, right? I get to play with a lot of cool new toys, um, but really kind of the more um, you know, empowering part of it is really that, you know, I get to kind of have a first line of communication with all of our display manufacturing partners and say like, hey, here's some feedback about your new display. Let's kind of work together to see what trends the market is going towards. And ultimately, we want all of our display manufacturing partners to succeed, right? And making HDR and more beautiful imagery accessible for the most amount of people is super fulfilling and super awesome. And that's kind of you know why I love what I do. But it's also great to be able to do trainings and kind of those aha moments where we're doing trainings and people kind of see vision for the first time or see the algorithm and work. I mean, that's what makes my job awesome. And that's why I love kind of working in these sort of collaborations with you guys is, again, we're just trying to push, uh, you know, knowledge and education out there that so many more people are aware of the cool possibilities of vision and HDR in general. So Nate, so here's the thing. I think there's still a lot of people have a different understanding of what HDR truly is, right? And maybe before we even go into the weeds with Dolby Vision and why it exists and there are good reasons for it, <laughs> a lot of good reasons, sure. um, maybe let's talk a little about what is HDR and let's let our audience know a little bit more about what that truly means, what high dynamic range actually is. HDR refers to high dynamic range. So historically in the past with older televisions, all of your content would be mastered and output in SDR, standard dynamic range. So typically we're talking about luminance levels in SDR from 0.1 nits all the way up to 100 nit max. HDR, we've completely opened the envelope here. So we're talking about black levels of all the way from zero to 005, all the way up to 1,000 nits and beyond. Some displays are even pushing 2,000, 3,000 nits nowadays, which is really exciting for the industry. But it gets complicated in how do we kind of manage this across a whole distribution pipeline. So it's interesting you're mentioning the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 nit. So we get a little bit into this nit race game, right? Yes, the and, knit arms race. Oh, the knit called. arms yeah. race. So uh, well, that's one of the things I think I would like to explain a little bit more why HDR, there's this assumption it's just about bright images, which is right. actually not. Right? No, no. So maybe we really want to make that clear in the first place. Absolutely. What does this truly mean, high dynamic range? Just because it's high doesn't mean it's all bright all the time. Correct, correct. So like I said, we're not just talking about your highlights with high dynamic range. And like you said, that's a very, very common misconception is, oh, HDR just means brighter pictures, brighter, 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 right. let's keep going brighter. That's actually not the case. So. With that extended dynamic range, you're getting a lot more details throughout the entire luminance range, not just at the high end with all your highlights and speculars, but at the low end in your shadow details mm -hmm. too. At the same time, you're also enabling a much wider color gamut, so you're getting more vivid colors um, in all the primaries across the range. So it's something really, really important to distinguish right away is that when we're talking HDR, it doesn't just mean brighter pictures. It means more details in your shadows, more vivid right. color. So when we look at this, so there's this diagram. Have a look at this. So there's the, for example, the comparison between 709 color volume, where you talked about this 100 nits peak luminance, right? Right. right. Versus the, uh, let's say, theoretically, I think 
the PQ curve that was defined as the Absolutely. EOTF goes to 10,000 10, units. Minutes. So, and then when we look at the color volume there with a, well, that's kind of a BT2020 color sure. versus the 709 color. Yes, when we yes. look at those two things, can you a little bit talk about this, what that volume thing actually means and how luminance of color plays an important part of this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you think about your typical standard dynamic range in the sense of the most common way to look at color gamuts in the past has been the triangle on the chromaticity diagram, right. right? Now, if you put that on its head and enable a third axis for luminance, then you'll very quickly see that as you expand in luminance, you're also expanding your volume for the color. So right. you're getting a lot more, you're able to get a lot more saturated reds, a lot more saturated greens and blues, but really enabling this entire ecosystem to kind of really evolve, not just in this kind of two-dimensional luminance space, but again, now we're talking wider color gamuts. Before we get into the weeds of Dolby Vision itself, maybe. Sure. Um, maybe again, maybe let's start a little bit about some historical stuff. How this all came into place. Sure. I mean, uh, for God's sake, normally Dolby is an audio company, right? Yes. yes Everybody I knows know, Dolby right? from audio, Absolutely. and you, had, you were the first company with with analog surround sound, Dolby sure. Stereo. Sure. You had Dolby Digital in the '90s with the Batman movies coming out. <laughs> um, then Dolby Two HD, and now you do even object based like Absolutely. Atmos. Absolutely. Absolutely. But people is like Dolby Vision is around for a, f a few years now, and right. it's getting right. more and more successful. You see it ramping up. Absolutely. Um, so uh, how does this all came in together? Paul? Yeah, I mean, sure, absolutely. I mean, preserving creative intent is the heart of Dolby Vision, right? That's exactly what our system is designed to do. So the basic idea with Vision is that Dolby was thinking, hey, could we start with a hero set of pixels, assign some metadata to that set of pixels that travels with that signal to wherever device you're watching it, whether it be your laptop at home, your TV, your tablets, your phones, whatever, and then have that metadata handshake then with the device and say, how can I best display this as it adheres closest to the creative vision. And that's kind of where tone mapping gets in. We don't have to dive too deep into that because I know <laughs> right. that's very complicated. But that was kind of the basic idea is preserving the creative intent across the most amount of mediums as possible. Interesting. And that means that you're also then most likely, and that's I would assume part of your job is also from the commercial partnership point of view, Sure, um, is where you have to deal with all those different parties involved, basically from the lens to the living room. Absolutely, kind of absolutely. From, from the production and pro, uh, production equipment manufacturers to the display manufacturers sure. who provide any kind of display, right? Absolutely, yeah. Color management is really, like you said, from lens to, to home, it's it's so, so important. And that's why a lot of these big studios have in-house color scientists, right, to manage these kinds of things. So again, super important part of what we do at Dolby, but really, again, the end goal is just to really empower the creatives to not only be able to tell their stories in whatever way they want as far as picture goes, but then ensuring them that down the pipeline that the folks at home are going to be viewing that as best as they possibly can on whatever device that's Dolby Vision enabled they can do. Historically, all these TV standards were made for CRTs, right? But there's no CRTs in anybody's living rooms right. nowadays, right? So everybody's viewing right. on, there's OLEDs, LCDs, so much variety in the way people are consuming content, not just on their television screens, but iPhones, tablets, Androids, laptops, so much variability here. So. From a filmmaker's point of view, when you take this great dynamic range you get from acquisition mm -hmm. on the camera side, you stretch it down to this SDR container and then right. you send it out to the world to view it. Now, in the past, it was easy, right? Because everybody's looking at CRTs. But right. now you're like, oh crap, You know, there's so much variety here. There's no way for me as a creator to ensure that what I made is gonna be produced the way I want it to, right? Yeah, so no one's gonna- say, right? Where they said, you were never, what was that? Just oh, yeah, yeah, day? so there was an old saying. So when you would go into a color bay, right? And you'd step out, you'd turn to the DP or director who you're sitting with and you'd right. say, man, we're never gonna see it like that Wow, again. that's pretty sad. It's super, super sad, sad. <laughs> super sad. The colorists, <laughs> and the whole creative team pour their heart and soul and hours right. and hours of their time into right. making this look a specific way. Yeah. And for a filmmaker, not having you know any sort of um, assurance that that's gonna look right. the way you wanted it to when it gets to the viewers, that's really disappointing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Dolby Vision in a nutshell, we're starting with a hero set of pixels that then has shot-by-shot -shot dynamic metadata attached to it via our Dolby Vision analysis. And that metadata then follows the content all the way to the end user, right? So essentially, the metadata is handshaking with the display device that's Dolby Vision enabled and saying, hey, this is what the content looked like when it was created. Now let's reproduce it with your best capabilities, right? Great. So let's talk a little bit about TVs. You have a team that also making sure that the Dolby Vision uh, reproduction is going to be as good as it can be, like your own display mapping, uh, sure. color mapping, and all those kind of things. Sure. Um, maybe talk a little bit about this, and then uh, we, we have a look at those TVs, like with this LG C2, for example, sure. where we have different picture modes, including a Dolby 
television mode. Absolutely. And also day and night modes for SDR content, right. so right. that you really can get all the modes right and really see whatever the content is about, right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And like I said, we're, we're trying to empower the entire market as a whole, right? And so the benefit of having Dolby Vision be a proprietary ecosystem is that we have the control to test all of our partners' displays. So Excellent. when a new product's gonna be coming out, they ship it to us and we can kind of tune around and make sure that the Dolby Vision reproduction is to our standards and within certain tolerances and looks the best at home to, again, preserve that in creative intent, no matter what mode of Dolby Vision or flavor they're looking at. Excellent. Yeah. And so um, let's probably uh, prep up for some Dolby Vision testing and do Dolby it. Vision calibration. And that gets us to the hands-on part. Awesome. So maybe let's start with some hands-on stuff first. Sure. Um, so you said you're doing a lot of analysis when it comes to when with your team, when it comes to figuring out what those displays do for the content creation side. Sure. Um, since Kalman has all those analysis tools and you use that tool too, uh, our tool, uh, maybe let's go a little bit through those different things. Sure. Maybe starting with the SDR analysis tool. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Like you said, Kalman's great not just for calibration, but also for display analysis as well. And the toolkit you guys have built out for both SDR and HDR is really robust. So for SDR, some of the things I really like to keep in mind here are use uh, color game. It's always useful because again, even for high-end reference displays, we want to make sure for our backwards compatible SDR content that we're still hitting those Rec. 709 primaries perfectly. Another good thing I like to use in here is luminance sweeps. Again, how is the display performing across a variety of luminance ranges up to that 100 nit max? And then the last part that I really like in both the SDR and the HDR color analysis tools is the color checker. So this is really useful because this is going to measure not just your typical, you know, uh, grayscale patterns or your full ramp RGBs, but this is going to measure patches that are a lot more relevant for natural content, right? And you can even see that here, you guys have named some of this stuff appropriately. So you have, you know, dark skin tones, light skin tones, blue sky, foliage, things that are going to naturally occur in content. So this is really more indicative of, hey, for the average creative looking to create human real life content, these patches are going to kind of get you in that right ballpark. And if I'm a filmmaker or a colorist, I want to make sure that my display is good, not just at those kind of extremities of the color gamut, but hey, these in-betweens that are going to really be what a lot of my content is going to be uh, composed of. So we've talked a little bit about some of the exciting things that are in the SDR analysis, but if we switch over to the HDR analysis toolkit here, they have some pretty cool measurements that you guys have built here that I use for a lot of my displays evaluation as well. So we let that load up. So th here we have a lot of great options. You have your typical grayscale tracking, you know, how well is the display handling PQ across the full luminance range. Another great thing is peak versus window size. So this is really good, especially when you're dealing with different types of display backlights. For example, OLEDs m might not be able to hold their peak luminance for a full field, whereas LCDs do. So that's kind of a great tool to find a display's kind of breaking point where mm -hmm. that auto brightness dimming comes into play. Just like in the SDR, you guys have a color checker here, which is great. And then another thing that I really like that you guys have included here is uh, really easily, you can measure not only the P3, but the 2020 gamut coverage of that display too. Because again, we want to make sure that if we're using this display for content creation, that it's you know fully encapsulating the colors that the gamut that we're working with can do. So what we also have with Kelman is the uh, Kelman Ready program that's basically part of Kelman Integrated Solutions. So that means that uh, Kelman itself can talk to the TV directly. And especially with the LG TVs, it's pretty nice with the OLEDs, for example, we can load a 1D LUT and a 3D LUT for calibration Absolutely. And, and get that really to a point where it almost looks like a reference display. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a reference display, right. you know, but the it's really- The best that it can be. Yeah, the best that it can be, right? Sure. And you're really very close to the artistic intent. Absolutely. Right? And so um, a part of that is auto calibration. So sure. that means that we connect to the TV first and then we can pick different picture modes which we want to calibrate. And one of that, for example, would be Dolby Vision. Sure. Um, maybe we should explain a little bit that we're not truly calibrating Dolby Vision, right? So, right. Because Dolby Vision is a system sure. and you have this mapping. Uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about this, kind of what that is, what we truly calibrate here? And yeah, then, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So when you're doing the auto cal through Calman here, you're really calibrating the panel characteristics under the hood. So in a sense, you're kind of bypassing the Dolby Vision tone mapping to alter the built-in or native panel characteristics to better suit the curve that we then put on top of it. 
Right, so we're basically just calibrating, just calibrating the underlying panel gamma. Correct. Actually. So right. you get this curve right, you get the RGB tracking right, the linearization of the panel is right, and so that in the end the quality is even better. Exactly. That's basically the idea. Exactly, right? yes. Right. The first thing we basically do is um, we reset all the settings that were probably there. So right. maybe in this case we had done a couple of calibrations with this model. Sure. So we want to erase all of this. It's called DDC Direct Display Control. Right. And so we're basically now overriding all the LUTs and everything, getting it back to the default setting. Perfect. Yeah. And that's actually also setting the TV into its native mode. Correct. So we get back to the idea of we're calibrating the underlying native Correct. whatever, Correct. you know, yeah, panel so gamma. Absolutely, yeah. So the, the native panel gamma underneath the hood is 2.2. So we're dealing with a, the PQ2084 curve, as you talked about earlier, is actually going to be kind of mapped on to that 2.2 starting point, And that's how we're going to kind of bypass our mapping to get this calibration done. Right, and that's actually sounds super smart to me because in the end of the day, and that's a, a, the, the other day on a Reddit post, I read that, hey, there's no need for calibration at Dolby Vision, right? Yes. I think yeah. that's one of the things where people still don't get the concept that, that there is an ecosystem or a system and there's still this kind of, there's this reference display, it's calibrated. There's the sure. TV and the home that should be calibrated. Absolutely. And everything should be aligned, right? Right, right. Yeah, no, that, that is a huge misconception is that Dolby Vision somehow takes care of calibration for you or that our mapping, you know, is self-calibrating. That, that's not the case. So still need to be doing your calibrations just like you would any normal display. Right, okay. And I think maybe also for already audience, what is still fixed is how Dolby is defining the mapping itself. Now in this case, like if you have an LG TV and the display mapper for Dolby Vision is in there, that's what your team worked on with the LG team exactly. to get that as good as it can be exactly. based on what comes from the studio in Dolby Vision. Exactly. That's the only thing that we don't change that Correct. needs not to be calibrated. Correct. But the panel itself and the characteristics is what we try to align and get correct, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. You hit it right on the head. Excellent, cool. So and here we get to the point where we basically have the grayscale autocal step for the calibration. So this is to create the 1D LUT. Maybe, what, what is a 1D LUT? Maybe you can <laughs> talk a little bit about what does that actually mean? Yeah, a LUT stands for lookup table. So what a LUT is doing is adjusting each individual, for this instance, grayscale step. So this is different than a single point adjustment, which you could do if you had, for example, let's say turned your uh, display to 100 nits and you made a manual adjustment via the built-in controls on your display. Let's say you have an RGB gain or bias sliders to do that and you're making an adjustment and you lock that in. What you've done is created a single point adjustment for 100 nits, right? So is that gonna then carry on for all the other steps, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where a LUT comes in because a LUT can do a step-by-step -step throughout the entire luminance range adjustment and measurement. So you get kind of a more holistic calibration. Right, okay, it makes sense. And, and yeah, that's, that's I think we, with some other partners, we have this, what we call multi-point grayscale. Yes. Versus really have a LUT that changes input to output exactly. values. And you basically can exactly. convert every, any value in any value, literally, literally with, with literally. a lot. Right, because if you're limited to just a, a single point adjustment, then you're essentially having to pick and choose, right? So let's say, you know, I only have access, I don't, I can't do a lot, so I only have access to a single point. Now I have to choose, hey, where does like the average luminance of my content live? Maybe that's 60 nits, so I should do it on 60 nit. But you're having that, without a lot, you have to kind of do that guess and check game, unfortunately. Right, right, excellent. So then we can start and click AutoCal. Now this is the AutoCal button, mm -hmm. and if I start this, the TV is starting to react and I'm waiting for the feedback, and then a window will open very soon where I can pick what kind of LUT I want to generate. Right. I think that's also very interesting. Then it really depends on where do I use this display or TV, and also how precise should this thing be. Correct. Because literally we can have so many different sampling points, then you can measure for hours. Yes, right? literally. literally. <laughs> or you just pick something where you say, well, it doesn't have to be as precise because we are, for whatever reason, then we can pick something that's much faster, right? Sure. Yeah. This this is again just a balance of speed versus performance. So if you're in a hurry, just pick a smaller LUT. But again, in a more lab environment where you're kind of looking at the more holistic picture, then maybe a more advanced larger LUT would be better suited. So what we here have is basically building the LUT iterative, which means it's actually building it while it's taking the reading. So it's sure. sampling a specific point, like in this case we are at uh, 
76 uh, percent and have uh, 0.5 from 45 total points that sure. we're just going to measure sure. to build the lot right and and so in this case it's kind of about 10 15 minutes to build this lot right as an example and it's really building it while it is measuring so it's kind correct. of back and forth until we have the point and the lot is already built in the background correct and that's even represented here on your common screen as well you can see it's measuring different points throughout the grayscale and as it's taking that measurement it's inputting that de that detail into that portion of the lot like you said this is a great thing about comment is you're demystifying this whole process to more novice users or like you said folks that maybe don't aren't familiar with calibration or not many of us are color scientists right so right <laughs> this is all great stuff I think the readings look pretty awesome don't they they look great they yeah look great so what would you say as a Dolby guy who knows what you're doing I would say I would be astounded with these results. I mean, again, especially for a consumer panel, this is incredible performance. Excellent, cool. Yeah, so what we see is then RGB balance is super linear. Yep. So we Perfect. have a delta of really, we, I think it was put somewhere below one, so it's really yep. in that range. Um, and um, that means that at that point, we're at a point that the grayscale tracking from black to white is super great. Looks great. That's exactly what it is. And you also see the PQ EOTF is really going up to a point that we have a very nice, neat tracking of the PQ curve itself. Absolutely. Right? Yep. It looks so great. So there's nothing that the display is adding to it that shouldn't be there. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So the signal is the reference. Yes. Right. And then we also see the same with the uh, color space, or I should say color gamut. So you see the uh, saturation points that we measured. So they're right there where they belong. And so the maximum delta of the um, color is also 1.6. It's fantastic. In the 2020 color space. Fantastic. For that point. And the same with the um, uh, average uh, uh, max delta E of 1.8, which is below 2. And that is what we want at least to uh, achieve. Right. Delta E of 2 is traditionally viewed as kind of the just noticeable visual threshold. So the people with average eyeballs can't see anything below too. So when your average is there, and especially when your max is below that, that's really great. Excellent, excellent. But then colorists on the other side, let's say in the professional domain, you would try to achieve kind of a 0.5 delta or something. Yeah, we would expect a reference display that costs $30,000 right. to have a little <laughs> more tight uh, response in color. But again, for a consumer panel at home, this is incredible. Right. And here we see the original one that was kind of whatever the picture mode was in the beginning. So you see we had a delta E of grayscale of an average uh, of 3.5, the maximum was 13.7, and uh, that was for the PQ ETF. Then we had the color gamut information had a delta of 1.1 and a max of 2.3. And then after the calibration, we basically see that um, we have a really nice looking display. So we have a 0.8 average, a max of 1.8 for the EOTF, which looks amazing. And at the same time, we also have the um, color gamut information here with a delta of one with a max of 1.6, which is kind of really neat if you start watching Dolby Vision stuff on yes, this TV. Yes, absolutely, right? absolutely. So thanks, Nate, for coming over and demystifying Dolby Vision for us. Thank you so much, guys, for having me. If you guys have any question about anything Dolby Vision, feel free to reach out to our knowledge base at professionalsupport.dolby.com. And if you want to learn more about Kelman and Portrait, go to portrait.com and let us know what you think in the comment section.